As some of you are already aware, I'm a software and application programmer for Altas IT. And I'm going to be taking you through Power Apps and Flow before handing off to our technical operations manager, Mark Davidson. So, Power Apps for a start, and some of you may be aware of it, but I suspect a large number of you are like, what is this weird thing in my tendency? Um, Power Apps really can be thought of at the front end, and you can see the many different versions of the event signing application there that we went through. Uh, Power Apps can really be thought of as a front end to displaying all of your Office 365 pieces. So everything from Outlook to Planner can be interacted with here. There's nothing more that I love than technical difficulties. <laughs> so to dive into Power Apps, I'll show you through one of the more useful templates here. Now, the meeting capture application is what we'll take a look at, but templates as a whole are Microsoft's demo applications, right? These are things that are already in the tenancy that you can create super quick and easy, but they only get you about 80% of the way there. And we'll see that shortly. So when we click on a template, we get this nice little demonstration view, but now let's just dive in and make the thing. We also get lots of nice waiting while we're making the thing, so if you want to render programming, now it's probably the perfect time. Or more ideally, seeing as it's Patch Tuesday, we could take some bets on what Microsoft's going to get wrong in the patch site. <laughs> uh, one of the things you'll note here is that a power app needs permissions to all the pieces it's going to touch. And I could read them out for you, but it seems to read well enough. Something we will really look at though is Office 365 users and this permission <coughs> right here. Read the full profile of all users. If you go back and make this in your tenancy, some of your users may not have this. It depends on when your tenancy was created and what the default permissions were at the time. But something to be aware of is when you're giving away permissions to Power Apps, you're not giving away your permissions. So you'll see here, something new with the thing about all tasks. If I hand that to Mark, it's using his permissions, not mine. I can't delegate permissions through Power Apps. It's one of its strengths, it's also one of its weaknesses. So we have here the Power Apps editor, and it's entirely web-based. There is an offline version, but Microsoft has plans on killing it that I believe actually start the end of this month, if I haven't already gone ahead and killed it. The three main parts of this that I need you all to take away from are a little drop down here, which is our properties window. Now this big thing we have in the middle, that's all of the properties of just the screen object of that. And next up, we have our formulas. So we can see that our fill property, so the color of this thing, is uh, whatever the hell that means. Uh, <laughs> finally, we have our screens over here, and it's not just screens, it's kind of badly named. This is all of the objects that make up our barrel. So every individual screen we navigate through, and every component of those screens. Right now, let's just dive in and take a look at what this thing does. So we have here, it's fantastic when things work, my demo event of Crown. Now, the aim of this application is most of you have out notepads, right? you would have been to countless meetings where everyone there has a physical notepad and a pen and they're writing down notes. And I'm sure at least once you've been like, hey, can you send me those notes that you got? Whole concept here is to eliminate that. So we have our meeting. We have all of our attendees. We can take notes right here. Some of you may get the reference. Uh, we also have planner tasks, so we can, from here, and it doesn't actually work very long with the template, this is something that you can build out though and make functional. The theory is from here, you can add planner tasks for individual users. On top of notes and planner tasks, we can draw pretty little pictures. So, not very useful when this is your level of artistic skill, what happens if we use a stylus? Uh, it's a hell of a lot easier. <laughs> but again, uh, one of the things that's broken in this is functionality with stylus. You can go back and fix it yourself, but 
right now we'll stick to simple things. Another thing is taking images. So you have that guy that's using his notepad or you have a whiteboard. You can take an image directly from the application. And you'll see here it's the front facing camera. Now, I don't know about you guys, I'm not big on in-meeting selfies. This is not the most useful thing, but we can change it and I will actually take you through how to change this. But for now, we'll take a picture anyway, just to see how things work. Now, we've got some attachments, we've got that diagram that we drew, and we've got a photo. We can go up here and go, well, I don't really want my in selfie, so let's blow that away. But my artwork might rival Picasso one day, so let's keep that. We can also export all of our notes, our drawings, our photos, from within the One UI. And as you can see here, you can export them to different locations. But again, OneNote functionality, it's definitely there. But to get it the whole way, you're going to want to invest some time on this. Uh, we'll also see by default, export to email is there. Export to email does work, it's fine, <laughs> mostly. Uh, for now, we'll just spam myself. And you can see if you're not in the attendees list, you can add someone. So if this was really important to John, or the notes from this were really important to John, I could email him directly from here with my notes, other than everyone else. So we'll finish, and then it'll give us a nice little export complete. Now, some of you might be thinking this is pretty cool, some of you might be thinking this is boring, but if you are thinking it's cool, the coolness deepens. We can schedule another meeting with everyone here. I would really like to attend this next meeting, so I'll add myself in there. We can add in a message, but for now we don't really care. We will attend the meeting, we know what it's about. We can find available times. So this is something, I don't know about you guys, but I've suffered with trying to pin down colleagues and their availability. So let's go a weekend in a week's time. And let's go to 10 a.m. because I'm not a morning skin guy. And I'd love the opportunity to wake up first. In theory. Sorry, if it says it's 30 minutes, why does it say it finishes at 5 f two? Oh, sorry, so this is the range of time that I'm okay with having this meeting. Right, so from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. as well. Oh, you get <clears throat> So we'll see. We have times here where we can actually see who we'd be missing if we went with these times. And it will present to us first at the top our time slots with 100% availability of all attendees. So that is meeting capture, and it's in your tendencies, super easy to spin up. I did tease that we would fix that camera and make it a little bit more usable. And I've uh, cheated and done it already, but I'll take you through how I did that. <laughs> Once it loads. Do you have to create this for every meeting? Can you from out with just questions? Sorry, um, the list of meetings there, it actually populates that off of your Apple calendar. So same with the reason you need read profiles access from 365 users is it knows who's attending those things in the Apple calendar, but to point in your picture and everything, it needs to read 365 users' profiles. How would I run the app if I was going to attend a meeting? Why would you run the app if you Oh, how? Oh, how? Uh, directly through Power Apps. Like on mobile? Oh, on mobile. whatever you want that it looks good on. One of the little caveats to Power Apps is if it hasn't been developed, specifically for the interface that you're working on. It'll still work, all the functionality will still be there, but resizing aspect ratios and things like that might not be. So then let's continue the actual app. So if I'm in out, I'm going to open a browser, go into Power Apps, and then start up meeting to make those. Uh, you would have to go just direct to Power Apps. Which or is you a could, standalone application. Yeah, which is a standalone application on your phone. Or if you're using it in the web, it's Right here. Doesn't it give it a URL? You can be able to use. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You can even embed it in SharePoint sites, yeah. right? So you can make an app and embed it straight into SharePoint site. You can share it basically however you want, assuming the person on the other end has the correct permissions to use it. Can you embed it as a tab in Teams? I would have to get back to you on that. So, slightly relevant. 
let's go back to fixing this camera. You can see I've already done it, assuming it works. Some of you can see yourselves. What I've done to achieve this is, by default, and I may get this wrong, the camera looks like this, or the uh, formula for the camera looks like this, and it's just pointing to zero. And now, the super dirty way of fixing it is to just go one, and it will select between zero and one camera. Assuming you have two cameras. Assuming you have two cameras, which, unfortunately, like I said, I'm not that big on selfies, but most devices have a front-facing camera. Um, the reason you won't just set it to one is because this value is different for just about every device you use. You know, iPhones versus older iPhones, it could be a one or a zero. We'll never know, and if you want to share this with other users, not very helpful. So what we've done instead is I've added in, in controls here, you can see we have a control called a toggle. Now, a toggle's values are true and false. And anyone who speaks computer knows that most of the time, it's one and zero. So we have up in the top right hand corner here a toggle. We can see this is toggle one. So fixing it is as simple as adding a toggle in and just going, I want the value to be the value of toggle one, whether it's true or false, and then it's entirely up to your users which camera they're using. So that is, in a nutshell, power apps templates. And definitely, if any of this caught your interest, talk to me about Power Apps afterwards. You can go a whole lot more with it. Like I mentioned, there is the signing app, which leverages a SharePoint site. And I'm hoping it worked, and you've all received your emails. Yes, fantastic. And we can do a whole lot. There will be generations of VB programmers going in there soon, right now. <laughs> well, Hopefully not VBA programmers, hopefully VBA programmers. <laughs> and anyways, on to Microsoft Flow. Now, if Power Apps is the front end, Microsoft Flow is the logic engine. So to expand on this a bit further, you can think of Flow like an Outlook rule. Except for your entire 365 suite. Now, with that in mind, it works very similarly. We define a trigger, we define a process that we want to take place after that trigger. Like I touched on, Flow, like Power Apps, can leverage your entire 365 suite. There are two applications, I think, being some Teams functionality and some Planner functionality that Flow doesn't really have a good handle on. But other than that, it's Outlook rules for 365 is the really simplistic way of thinking about it. And even further than that, and what I mean by that is you can see here we have things like Salesforce and Adobe Creative Cloud peppered in with all of our Microsoft functionalities. Now what this is, is this is just a screenshot of connectors in Flow. And this is just a handful of them. This is a heap more. On top of this though, if this doesn't do it for you, you also have HTTP flows, which you can use to do your own REST lookups. So anything with a web API, you can leverage flow against it. And just to drill home this point about Microsoft connecting to connectors outside of the 365 tenancy, we have here Save a Gmail to Google Drive which was published by Microsoft. Now these are a list of templates like we saw with Power Apps. I'd love to know what's going on there. This is a list of templates that you can go and press, and these are all good to go and click the button. It's really interesting to note that Microsoft is changing their tone and moving away from everything Microsoft all the time towards we want to bring in external partners and even big ones like Google. For now though, We'll stick with Office 365, and I'll just take you through a quick demo of saving a 365 email attachment to OneDrive for Business. So this is what it looks like when you go to create a flow from a template. Vaguely similar to Power Apps, and very similar to Power Apps is our permissions. And same deal, if you share a flow with one of your users or a colleague, it's their permissions, not yours, 
Now, you can set up flows that will run just on a SharePoint list constantly under your own permission set, but delegation isn't really a thing that works with Flow yet. So this is what a flow looks like. Uh, to a lot of you, it will look like just a flow chart. To a lot more of you, I imagine, it will look like just a mess. But it really does become pretty clear once we start to break it down to its pieces. Like I mentioned, similar to Outlook rules, we need a trigger. And for this, it's any Office 365 email that comes in, I want you to start this process. The first step in this process is an apply to each. Now, anyone who has any sort of programming background or logic background will see this as a for each loop. So for every one of these attachments, I want you to do some actions. We start off with just creating a file in OneDrive for business. And then we have a condition. And we have this cool looking little thing in the condition, which is an equals and a couple of brackets. And it really means nothing to no one. And then you pull out the actual formula that it's made of, and it means even less. So what this is actually doing is saying, if my create file fails, it'll come back with this code of 409. If that condition is true, then I want you to do this yes block down here. Sorry, skip that. And then we're just going, okay, wait 60 seconds, or whatever this delay is, and try to make the file again. So this is the result that we get just from running the flow. Now you'll see here, I was interested in this file. And this is my user, uh, this is being a user is what I expected to get. The attachment on the email, the item that was actually attached. What I ended up with is every single image that makes up the sender's signature plus the attachment that I thought I was going to get. This isn't particularly useful unless you're aiming to fill up your OneDrive for business. So we go back to the drawing board. And what I did was I just moved the create file, I got rid of the recreate file, and I got rid of the delay because I'm kind of impatient. And we repurposed the condition. So I'm not creating something first anymore anyways, so this would just always have failed. But what we can do, and this is without having to use a formula, this when you're looking at it is just select a list of items. And the item I want is the content type of my attachment. Now if that's not an image, then I want you to create the file. But if it is an image, I don't want you to create that file. So if it's a JPEG, you won't get it? Yeah, absolutely. What happens if you want the JPEG? That's the attachment you want. Good question. Um, you can build this logic out anyway. No. This is a really simplistic example. Right? Yeah. So here we go. I've got my remote access guide, and I haven't got any of the clutter. Um, to your question, how do I make it useful? Um, actions. So we can add in more actions, more triggers. When I'm talking about actions, I'm talking about these guys. And you can see here we've got a bunch of different connectors, including the HTTP connector I teased before, which can be used to look up REST APIs, web APIs of whatever web services you're using that happen to have them. And we have over 300 actions for all of our different types of connectors. With 300 actions and the types of logic we're talking about, while it's not going to get you as far as actual .NET logic or VB logic, you're going to be able to build a lot of really cool tools in Flow. And just a free bit of advice, filter your data. Now what I mean by this is you can actually use formulas to grab a variable of just the type of data that you want to work with. Now the reason you would do that instead of just passing it to a for each is in flow, one of the little gotchas is a for each or an apply to all as it's called in flow will stop at 100. Now you would think you would get some sort of error or warning when it stops at 100. When you're iterating through a SharePoint list of 10,000 items, I want to know if you've hit that limit. Won't give you that. You need to make sure that your data is filtered and you're only working on the data that you want to be working on. And to that end, knowledge is power. The more little caveats like this you know about, the more of these 300 actions that you're familiar with, the more powerful the tools that you can build are. 
I will hand off to Mark Davidson, our technical operations manager.